Hi, yeah, and welcome to the Guildford Games Festival interview sessions. We're here at Stellar Entertainment with Paul Ross. Hi. Hi. How are you doing? I'm all right. Very excited to be here and talk to you. I'm pleased. We'll kind of start from the start, Paul. So I reckon you should just give us a little bit of a, a rundown of, of what you've done, where you've been, what sure. you've seen, that kind of stuff. Uh, so my name's Paul Ross, and uh, I'm the founder of Stellar Entertainment. We've been going over five years now, but I entered the games industry here in Guildford in 1996. And I joined Criterion Games, and I still remember coming on the train and visiting Guildford. And as I walked out of the interview, I thought, there's no way I've got that job. And I looked at the train station as we left Guildford. I just had one more look at Guildford, because I'll probably never come here again. <laughs> and uh, I was amazed that um, I got the job, and I came here in 96. I worked uh, at Criterion. I worked on the Burnout series, and then on the Need for Speed series. And then uh, I left. Um, having had a lot of experience in making video games, I did another startup, and then I formed Stella, uh, like I say, just over five years ago. And uh, we've been doing an awful lot of work back with our great friends at Electronic Arts and Criterion, and with Amazon Game Studios and a few other um, great people to work with. And it's just been a really, really great ride. And I think Guildford's a wonderful place oh. to make video games, it and it is. really is, you know. Yeah, and I think just, just what you've kind of gone over there, the fact that it's it's collaborative. We're not just, oh, here's a studio and here's a studio. There are opportunities for us to work together yeah. outside of being in a pub or yeah. you know, the other chances that we get to, to uh, hang I th out. Yeah. I think very interesting. I've always joked that it's probably easier to get a, a video mixed together and the audio and the special effects done for it is than to get a, a tap changed here in Guildford because it is very much a game-making yeah, city through and through. Yeah, you're, you're absolutely right. You can't. Uh, you probably couldn't walk down the high street without bumping into uh, yes. a developer of some description. So what I wanted to talk to you about today and, and kind of thinking about the experiences that you've had and the studios you've worked at, how you would go about building a studio uh, and the, the kind of detail and, uh, yeah, just experience, I guess, that, you, yeah. that you've got in doing that. So my first question is quite literally, where do you start? Like at what point as a creative, as a studio head, do you think, right, now's, now's the time to actually push this into the next, well, the next gear? Well, for me personally, um, I started out uh, making house rental business. That's what I started off doing. So when I was getting my bonuses through, I was investing in property and I was getting them ready for um, students to live in. And that was my first real entrepreneurial spark that I demonstrated. And uh, those businesses were terrible. We got absolutely turned over. They were loss making. They were, they were awful. But I needed to go through that to learn the importance of how you measure, how you manage your cash flow, how you actually plan, how you start to put plans together, and how you can actually plan out what your future is going to look like and how you come up with a working viable business mon um, model. So. In a funny way, I started out in business and building a studio, nothing to do with games. But the great thing about house rentals is a very solid, stable business. It's the total opposite of games, which is very chaotic <laughs> and very dynamic and very changeable. So it was actually a great um, founding. So I started off there, managed to build a, a business that was making money and generating cash. And then um, I basically started up uh, Stella. I think it was more to just proved to myself that if I actually started a business, what would what would happen? I just needed to know. And I think if it's in you and you're driven to do it, then you will do it. There is no wise wherefores or any of that kind of thing. For me, it wasn't about glory or money or any of that stuff, although that's all very nice, don't get me wrong. It was very much, I just had to know it. And I remember saying to my wife, before I go to my grave, I need to know what would happen if I started a business. So that. that's kind of why and how I got started. And the other thing I would say is, I remember, still remember very clearly going to Chinatown in London, in Soho. This must have been the late 90s. And uh, I went off to the fortune teller. It was a girlfriend wanted to go, I'm a scientist. Well, that's all a load of old rubbish. None of that really <laughs> makes any sense, but I won't. Anyway, and he, he looked at me and he very, very intensely looked at me and said, you're gonna start a business, it's gonna be successful, and you're never going to have a problems getting contracts. And I still think back to that time now, because that's how Stella has been. 
was he right or does he just say that to everyone? Did you have like, it written on the back of your T-shirt? No, I had Magic. nothing. Yeah, but I, I, me, I remember just it. I still remember he just looked at me very intently and he just delivered that to me. I thought, wow, that's quite interesting. That is interesting. Yeah. So, so from there, you know, you, you, you've got it in you. You want to start a studio. You want, you know, you want to kind of be, be at the head of, of pushing forward with, yeah. with groundbreaking uh, technology as we do. What comes first? Is it, I've got a group of people that I think would make a, a great team and maybe we should do it that way? Or is it, I've got an idea for a game and I'm going to build a team from there? So I think that there is no real formula. And the thing is I've learned over time is that studios and companies are a reflection of the people that are in them and run them. And so for me personally, I just took on a few contracts making some software and uh, it kind of got out of hand quite quickly. And before I knew it, I needed somebody to help me with QA. So I took somebody on to help me with that. I also needed somebody to help me with localization. So we took some of that on. And then we needed a few coders. So we took some coders on. Um, and then I phoned up some people that I really, really trusted. And, and that's the thing. You need that very, very trusting network around you. People that you would gamble your life with. And people that will be honest about yes. the situation that's in front of them. Yeah, Exactly. Absolutely. So you've got... Uh, our creative director Chris Roberts who agreed to come and join me and uh, get on this crazy rocket ride um, I'm still forever grateful that he, he said yes I took him to a three-person Regus office and um, I showed uh, I, I managed to get the Stellar Entertainment logo up on the wall before he arrived to try and make it look like it wasn't just a, a, an empty Regus office <laughs> and rather insanely he agreed to join us um, and then I reached out to a business guy Doug McConkey because we were just getting bigger and bigger and it was coming too much um, so it was about building that real clear network around you of people that you absolutely trusted and you also got to kind of think in a similar way as well you know, there's no point in having somebody who's all about mobile if you're all about PlayStation 5 for example so it was about having that good um, group around you and the other thing I would honestly say is that you need that strong home life as mm. well and that home stability and I think that when a lot of people look at Stella and they say, oh, isn't it great? And you've managed to do this and, uh, you know, all these people have helped you. So I think that the, the wives and partners and family of those early founders and those early people just don't get the recognition because they're just as important mm. to it as everyone else. Yeah, you're absolutely right. So I would say it's about building that, before you do anything else, it's about building that initial group. And then, you know, you'll figure it out as time goes on. Whilst it's nice to have a rough plan as to where you're going to go and what's going to happen, you just this business is just unplannable. It really is. If you're making a video game and that can sell anything from zero to ten million copies, then how on earth can you build a plan around that? I mean, you, your revenue from it's going to be somewhere between zero and half a billion pounds. Yeah. So, well, if that's it. And then if you add the situation that we've had in the last couple of years, where we've all been sent home from studios, and yet yeah. sales of video games are not slowing, that we're still having to really kind of uh, produce a, a fantastic. Yeah. Um, products at the other end, regardless of, of where we are physically, I suppose. Yeah, it's it's a it's a really interesting thing. What you were saying about about trust and kind of starting the foundations with people that you know you know you can you can do this with ultimately that have that shared vision. So once you have that, the studio culture and and this is something that I am such. I mean, again, it's probably something that people have heard me bang on about a lot, but I'm, I'm, I'm really quite pro having a, a defined, healthy, understandable studio culture. Um, so is that something that you would, does it kind of grow organically if you're starting your own business and there's, there's three or four of you that you know and trust, you know, you all know each other and trust each other. Does it just grow from there or is it something that you define? Well, like I say, I think it will be a reflection as to who you are as a person, who those initial personalities are. And I think very much when you look at Stella, we were always, um, I love traveling. I used to spend a lot of time backpacking. So I've been to India and Cambodia and all over the world. And so naturally that's in me. So when you look at Stella, even though we were about 45 people, we actually have 14 nationalities working for us. So that's not something that you can sit down and say, right, the success blueprint is you need to have 14 people. They'll bring <laughs> of course, lots of diverse yeah. ideas. You need at least 25%. We're not as metric driven as that. And for us, it kind of evolved over time. But it very much comes from who you are uh, as people. And I think, for example, um, 
Doug McConkie, our business guy, is very sporty. He's that loves to play golf. And there's a certain element of physicalness. And we play in the five-side football teams. And, hey, we won the uh, Guildford Cup as well, as, as I oh, remember. Yes. So, so you um, did. So that, but that didn't come from me. That came from Doug because that's very much what he who he is and I think uh, Chris is fantastic at uh, video games also films he's really into movies and films so when you look at our Slack channels they talk a lot about movies and films and the latest uh, uh, releases that have come out so in some ways the culture will come organically you can't you've got to let it happen but what you end up with at the end is generally kind of almost predictable you could have predicted it it's the most obvious thing that you could see but it's only when you actually get there um, will you actually recognise, of course there's going to be that, and it's going to yeah. be travel and things like that. And I think, you know, like we've just opened our studio in Utrecht, and that's very much because I've had a love affair with the Netherlands ever since. So I worked there as a student, uh, did my placement year there. So of course that was in me. So as soon as we got to a point where we needed to expand, that was the obvious place to go. Mm -hmm. So that culture you, you will set. But I also think as the lead of the studio, it's down to you to prune that and to make sure it's absolutely healthy and I think um, very much for me I believe in liberalism and I believe in being very open and transparent and when you look at um, Stella it's very much an embodiment of that we believe in people being free free speech people being who they are we also agree um, for example my I've had uh, a wedding I went to with my father and I was sat there thinking to myself I shouldn't be here I'm fixing to I need to be back at work fixing bugs and he said to me he said Paul is this a real pain for you to be here today and I said no of course not dad no of course not uh, and then inside I was thinking yes it's a massive pain I shouldn't be here I've got all these bugs to fix and I felt so bad from that that we have the policy here which is family first so in some ways a lot of the negative experiences I had in the games industry have been reflected in Stella and changed and flipped around. So we say here that it does not matter what is happening. If you have a family issue or you want to take your child out to um, sports day or any of that kind of thing, then that really takes priority. So you will discover that culture, I think, but it's got to be worked on and you've got to find it over time. I think, yeah, I 100% I, I agree and, and sadly have seen those situations where the culture is just not thought about. It's not. It's not defined. It's not discussed. Let's just see what happens, and then nothing happens, and it can become a little bit negative. So it's amazing to to see that you guys are, you know, have been considering it and, and considering what you're passionate about and what keeps you kind of engaged in the wider world as opposed to just video games. Yeah. But you're absolutely right when it comes to, to to family, for example, because ultimately, if we are, and you know, we all know crunch is bad. We all know, you know, enforced crunch is especially bad. Um, but if you are in a situation where you've, you know, like you described with your with the wedding, and you've got bug fixing or whatever um, needs doing, the families of, of developers can make some sacrifices in order for us to do what we do. So yeah, I think it's it's really important to be able to take that that step away and give everyone that yeah kind of agreement that that's how it works family first yeah, yeah that's... well we're not 40 developers in a room we're probably 120 developers in a room when you take on everyone's family and the dependents mm. who relate and i think we, you have yeah cats dogs <laughs> living together you have to um you have to remember that and think about that and that's just as important that people's families are important with their employees being here mm. as everything else and it's something that we think an awful lot about mm. and consider a lot it's good to hear and when it comes to hiring, so you've you've got you know your your studio, your culture, um, your your friends ultimately within within that space. How do you ensure when you're speaking to prospective hires that they're going to be the right fit for the uh, for the studio, for the culture, for the individuals? Sure. Well, I mean that's it. You could write almost a book <laughs> on that exact. How, and I think <laughs> there probably are people that have written books on it. I would say the thing that we've learned over the past is I've worked in studios where intelligence was everything and it didn't matter how difficult a person you were or how hard you were to work with, as long as you were intelligent enough, then they would take you. And I think that that led to some fairly toxic working situations. And I honestly feel that you would get more from five people who are 80% intelligent but completely aligned than you do from five 100% intelligent people who are just extremely difficult and are all prima donnas. So for us, I would say, obviously, we're looking for the full package. So we want somebody who can do art or could code or do everything to a, to a really good world-class level. 
but we're also looking for that fit that's so important to us and um, do they have it any interests outside and often people will write I'm into video games uh, game jams and it's like well you're applying to a video game company so I kind of presume that that's the case it's a given. Yeah. Uh, but what we're also looking for is world experience and roundness of, of personality so anybody that's been out and traveled again travels part of me I've absolutely loved it so anybody who has uh, traveled extensively and is backpacked then I love them straight away because it means that they know how to handle their money book a hotel get from A to B, deal with people who may not speak their language and from a different culture. And those kind of collaborative people who can who are able to do that and demonstrate an ability to do that will generally do quite well on a game yeah, team. Problem solvers, I yes. guess. Yes. Yeah. So if they and if into the bargain they're pretty good at writing software and they're quite pretty well rounded people, then they're ideal. Mm -hmm. So I think that's how you go about finding those people. Um, though almost those Leonardo da Vinci's that are artistic scientific and great people to hang around with you know yeah. that's what we're all looking for yeah. and and yeah you're absolutely right you know we're working with a lot of creatives and with that creativity can come ego and that's cool like egos are cool as long as they're yeah within a certain realm I suppose and and you know have that humility to be able to, to yeah. step it down when when they're with a team yeah absolutely it's a but I think very much video game making is a team sport mm. through and through and you see all the dynamics that you see in any kind of team sport you really do so um, it's important that you gel that team together and um, you know sports football teams for example have done this for ages they've done cinema trips and theatre trips and they understand the importance of all of that and that's very very important to us here at Stutter as well yeah absolutely it's fantastic um, so what makes this is this is a very broad question what would you say makes the perfect, in inverted commas, working environment for a creative? <laughs> it's a good one, right? Yeah, that <laughs> is. We're going to be here all day. Yeah, and that's something that we, that we thought about and we thought long and hard about. Um, all creatives are slightly different and they're all driven uh, in different ways and arguably some of them are damaged in different ways as well. Um, but I would say that uh, their needs are, are, are generally quite diverse I would say for us here at Stella the first the things that we're really looking for are to be driven by being the best at what we do and being number one and I think that um, winning breeds more winning so when we were setting up the um, the environment and Stella we're trying to reinforce that we're here to really do a great job to be the best in the world and um, they are part of that and for example when you look at the Stella offices We've done them very, very beautifully. We've decorated them beautifully. We have nice um, uh, signs up and we've put some lovely artwork around that was far too expensive to purchase. <laughs> um, but we've done that to show people that this is we're serious about this. This is what we're doing. We're here to win. We're here to be number one. We're here to do a really, really great job. And it comes from a theory that I had, which is called the broken windows theory that emerged in New York in the 90s. And uh, when they were trying to um, police the Bronx, they, dis they discovered that there was a social theory that evolved that if you had broken windows appear in an area, then people saw it as decay and they started to decay. And then other people would move in. They would be doing you know, muggings or whatever. And the whole area started to go downhill. So the idea was that if you fix the broken windows, then the whole area will remain vibrant and will remain healthy. And it's really a theory that I've bought into quite considerably a long way uh, all the way through my career so when we have creatives here at Stella what we're doing is we're making sure they have the best uh, PCs the best tools they can work with they have a lovely environment to work with they get um, great tea and coffee and they get great snacks and everything that we do here is done really really well to the highest level that we possibly can from equipment to environment to the um, social events that we do because we're trying to show them this is important we're trying to be really really great and it comes back to that broken windows theory that i subscribe to is what if you should put somebody in an environment that's really nice and really good they will respond to that in a really nice and a really good way so the ideal environment for a creative is a beautiful ornate taken seriously um environment that they wish to be in mm. you know yeah. When it's roasting hot here in Guildford in the summer, you want really good air conditioning. So it's sometimes it's as simple as that, and yeah. sometimes it's, it's a lot deeper.
Yeah, and and just to say it worked, by the way, I came here for the first time this morning and, and stood there and bothered all of your staff. Like, wow, oh my gosh, this is so cool. So right. yeah, it's working, it's working. Um, yeah, that's that's super interesting. It's, it's, it is about the, the feeling, right? It's about feeling respected, feeling looked after, feeling important when you walk into a studio um, and kind of going back to, to my first experience in, in video games at EA, it gave me that like, oh my gosh, I work here. Yeah. Like, this is amazing. And even down to getting a Coke from the fridge, just like, oh my gosh, this is, I'm in a special place. I need to act like I'm a special person too, because yes. you know, these guys obviously are. It really does add a, a kind of spring to your step and make you feel like you're part of something. Yeah. Um, just, you know, a fizzy drink in the fridge. Who knew? <laughs> Who knew? Um, Okay, so we, as we've discussed, we've been dealing with not being in studios together, not enjoying lovely spaces, not necessarily having cold drinks in our fridges, depending on how organized we are. Um, how have you guys retained that team feeling and tried to almost continue rewarding your staff, I suppose, when you're yeah. all at, at a distance? Well, it's difficult. It, it really is difficult, and everyone has struggled with this. Um, I'm involved with some other organisations outside of video games and work, and they've got exactly the same challenge. It's not just peculiar to video games. It's pretty much all sectors. Um, and my wife works at the university, exactly the same problem, and it, it, it is a really hard problem to solve. Zoom, um, Hangouts, and all this stuff, it does help. But really... Um, it's seventy percent of what it, what you really get with that in person contact, and it, it's hurt us as a studio, to be brutally honest with you. Uh, but there are things you can do to mitigate it. So we often um, have team hangouts on a Friday afternoon at four o'clock, so everyone gets together and they just talk about movies they've seen or whatever else that they, they've been to or games they're talking. We just kind of chew the cud, really, just as you would normally. Uh, Friday afternoons. Yeah, all throughout Friday, Friday, the Friday. week, you yeah. know, as it just ad hoc that you're missing out on. Yeah, yeah. for sure. So it just uh, allows us to do that. Um, and also, I think the other thing we've done is uh, we've been sending care packages home to our staff just to make sure that they are appreciated. So, for example, it's Diwali next week, so we'll be sending out uh, Indian sweets to everyone so they can uh, enjoy those. And it's just really trying to keep those connections together. But there is no no magic bullet to it it really is a fairly corrosive environment work at work at home um, obviously there's some benefits to it I think it's great that people have a better work-life balance mm -hmm. that they can finish up work and they can walk away from the desk and their home and their we, families aren't sacrificing quite so much whilst yeah. they're all in the same space yeah and it's also sure. basic things like uh, do you remember if a plumber had to come around it was such a major operation you had to book time off sorry I won't be in tomorrow at 10 o'clock I got the plumber and then the plumber was late and then you got into work late and uh all of that stuff has gone away. And so I think that whilst we at Stella do look to come back to the office um, in some way, shape or form when it's uh, safe and people are happy to come back, I think that um, we also have to retain some of those benefits that we picked up from work from home. Um, you know, I love the fact I could go and collect my boy from school, uh, be there to meet him, take him home, and it was half an hour break really, which I'd taken throughout the day. So there was a lot of benefits to that. And I think that whilst it was punishing at times, especially for people's mental health, there are, we've learned a lot of great lessons of things we want to keep about a lot of the benefits of it. So it wasn't all negative. It was, there, was a lot of, there was some good there. That's good to hear. And have you found with, with those of you that are coming back to the studio, are there any challenges to, you know, personally, yeah. I'm finding myself having to build myself up before going out for, you know, for work, essentially, yeah. to go and do interviews because it's, it's just me and the dog most yeah. of the time. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, have you, have you encountered any obstacles in, in coming back? Well, I think there is a certain amount of, of friction because the downside, to, so once you get here and you get back to this studio, it's wonderful. You've got a big, lovely desk. You've got a big, lovely TV. All your work stuff is now out of the corner of the front room and it's now in the office. Uh, you've got more space at home and obviously having Guildford on your doorstep is fantastic. We've got so many restaurants and bars and you have to go and post a letter. It's all very easy to do. So that stuff is, is all one way and very seductive to bring people back in. The biggest problem is the commute and people are just nervous about doing that. And I hate it as well. I hate Guildford traffic. I really do. I ride a 50cc moped because... The traffic just drives me insane coming into work. And that's probably the biggest obstacle that people are less keen on is getting back to that daily commute. But we've now learned that it's okay to do the meetings at home at 9 o'clock and for us to do our Slack calls and everything. And then it's okay to maybe take the train at 10 o'clock when it's a bit quieter or to drive in when it's quieter. 
Um, previously, we would never have done that because, well, we we're all here at nine, let's get started at nine. But we now learned that, that it's okay to do that. And actually, it's more sane to do that. Yeah. And certainly, I look back to some of the things that we had previously. I remember there was one guy I worked with, he used to commute to London. So he would be there nine till six and then sp spend two hours on a train going back home. And really, that was insane. He should have left at four and worked on the train for yeah. two hours to get back home. So in some ways, we have learnt uh, an awful lot of good things. And I think that um, it's outside of that commute, it's just a one-way win to be back in the studio outside of COVID. And mm -hmm. hopefully, mm -hmm. you know, this pandemic will come to an end at some point. Yeah. Well, fingers crossed, Dave. They're now saying next spring. So yes. It's just everything crossed. Um, well, I think they're game developers. They keep telling us next spring, yeah, next it. spring, just next spring. Just keep pushing it. Just keep pushing it. We'll ship it at some point. We'll definitely we'll ship normality. A, yeah, it's we'll coming. do it as a DLC. <laughs> um, yeah, I can completely understand the kind of trepidation, I suppose. And it is that, you know, as soon as you're there, everything's normal, everything's fine. This is what I what I love about it, yeah. uh, about what I do is, you know, being around these people. I hope it's the same for, for most developers. Um, but yeah, I think the lockdown has given us some sanity in, yeah. our, in our working days to realize, okay, yeah, if I love my job, of course I'll travel two hours to get there, but I should be able to, to kind of jiggle the day around a little bit to, to ensure exactly. that it's, it's working for me as well. Because... Yeah. You don't do your best work unless you're feeling your best. And if you're exhausted and burnt out and having to sit on a train for two hours, it's turning into three or four with, uh, with whatever else might be going on. Um, yeah, it can be absolutely mentally exhausting. Absolutely. Um, yeah, that's cool. I think, I think that's hopefully something that we're all experiencing after lockdown, that we can just be a little bit less, yeah. you know, kind of pushing ourselves all of the time. Um, I did ask the Guildford Games dev cord, as we call it, as a Discord. But we call yeah. it the dev court, um, if they wanted to add anything um, and ask you any questions. And we had quite an interesting one, which is, you know, kind of building a studio remotely. And I know that you guys, you know, you're established, you've been here for, for five years or so. But during lockdown, were there points when you had to grow? I know we're seeing a lot of the bigger studios are doing huge recruitment drives because video games haven't stopped during lockdown, as we've discussed. Mm. Um, yeah, did you find any challenges to that side of it, like recruiting and doing studio fits whilst at home? Yeah, I mean, that is tremendously difficult. So the first very practical thing um, is because you are now recruiting and you're not in the studio, you haven't got that real-time feedback as to how much space you're eating. So I think most people have now got to the point where they've continued to recruit probably don't have the studio space to put everyone back in the studio and that was a very proud and I remember asking a few times have we hit that have we hit the tipping point that we can't go any further I think we hit that um, quite quickly so that's one practical point of doing the remote recruitment I think the other thing is that um, HR and that initial screening you're now looking for somebody who's more of a TV presenter mm. because so much of it is online is going to be so much TV based so we started to change how we were presenting ourselves and how we were reacting uh, because it was becoming more of a TV interview more than anything else um, but yeah it, it's it's hard because you are got half an hour to get to know somebody and whilst it's okay you possibly can do that from a CV and over uh, over a stream I was quite surprised that when we met people for the first time when we could finally start to come out of some form of lockdown just how different they were uh, in real life now thankfully everyone so far has worked out for us and, has, and we've met them in real in uh, as Chris refers to it we've met them in 3d nice. and um, they, they, they've been really great people so for us we've been lucky with it it doesn't seem to have adjusted us too much but we are that very very thorough on the amount of interview and we do because we we just don't risk it. Mm. We always say we're probably one higher away from breaking the studio. So we always make sure that we're, we're very, very thorough. But for us, um, yes, it presents challenges, but it's easier. But on the other hand, it does also present an opportunity because you've now got a much wider recruitment pool than you had previously. That's true. And if you set up uh, pay centres within the EU, for example, then you go from recruiting somebody that could only come to Guildford or maybe works in the UK so suddenly you've got like the whole EU to recruit from and um, so it, it can actually be a blessing and a curse but overall for us I would say it, it's it's worked quite well for us. Rad and have you found any unusual tactics kind of making it into these interviews now I don't know like 
playing Uno together or I don't something that's <laughs> going to give you another kind of dimension of the individual that you're that you're dealing with that you wouldn't well the the amazing thing is you get to see everyone's home environment so that gives you an awful lot of yeah. information that you never had before Ooh, as to uh, what they I've look like thought about that yes. and is there i mean do you immediately notice if someone's using a zoom background like okay that's something to be asking about what's going on there <laughs> well no I, we wouldn't and it's actually quite rare that people seem to do that they do tend to show you their home now obviously they think about it and they have a nice picture of them or something like that and they don't show the house embarrassment part of their home um, but I think that's been tremendously interesting and I think as I remember hearing that the police when if you in if they interview to be a police officer will go to your home and will interview you at your home so they get to get more of a feel as to who you are and in some ways that's helped us uh, a little bit um, I would say as well seeing um, all the contrabands hidden <laughs> if they had contraband yeah, of course of course if um, Paul, one more question, and it's, it's a one question that's got three answers, so sorry yeah. about that, but it kind of counts. Um, just your, your kind of top don'ts for, for starting building a studio, or top three do's, your, yeah. your choice, whichever spin you want to take on that. So I would say the top three don'ts are um, don't be scared and don't be undersell yourself and just go for it because... This could be your one and only chance to do it. This could be it. So now is not the time to have faint heart or to be too scared about what you're going to do. The second thing I would say is don't wrap your personality up in your company too much. Your company is a separate entity to you. It's not your family. It's not you. If the company fails, then it failed. Sometimes that will happen. Sometimes it's sad. It really is. It's video games. Yeah. But you, you didn't fail. You did the best you possibly could at the time. And I would say uh, the third thing about it is don't be dishonorable to anyone that you're dealing with. It doesn't matter. And, and funnily enough, I learned this from house rentals. Um, when I was in Portsmouth and I was renting out student houses, there was a, uh, a land agency I was dealing with who were absolutely awful. And, um, for example, one thing they said, should we put a dishwasher in your house? I said, yes, please. And I got down there and I found they put the dishwasher in and we're charging the tenants £10 a week uh, rent on the dishwasher. Oh, gosh. Uh, and I said, well, we have to stop this. But I never, ever sunk to that level. And I, was just, and I never acted dishonorably. And in the end, the lady went to prison for embezzlement. Now, when the police did the investigation, because I'd always acted um, honorably, um, there was absolutely mm -hmm. nothing on me. And I think that's true in any business dealing and everything you do. And even if you have an employee that it doesn't work out with and you're maybe slightly annoyed with them for whatever, you can never, ever act dishonorably. Mm -hmm. And with other companies, you have to understand they're trying to pay their staff. So never act dishonorably. So I can only say that that is probably more important than anything else. And even if it co costs you some short-term pain, then never ever act dishonorably because you don't know how that will end up. And I learned that lesson very, very early on. So I would say they're the top three for me. That last one in particular, I absolutely adore. I think that's fantastic. Paul, thank you so much for not only taking the time to, to talk to me, but letting me into your lovely, lovely office and, and to meet the team. You're very welcome. Thank you.